All right. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to our November 2021 Pro Tools Tech Talk webinar. My name is Gil Gowing, and um, we are going to be sharing with you today um, some information about uh, a couple of new releases that we came out with at the end of October. Uh, going over kind of what's new uh, with Pro Tools 2021.10 and Yukon 2021.10. Um, with me today presenting uh, will be uh, myself, uh, Simon Sherborne, who is one of our audio solution specialists from uh, our EMEA team located over in the UK, as well as uh, Jeff Komar, uh, audio solution specialist uh, located here in uh, Wisconsin here in the US. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in and uh, let's get going with this. So uh, first thing we wanna take a look at are some of the new features that we have in Pro Tools 2021.10. And uh, I think one of the biggest things that, that this released is some just some more compatibility uh, that we have uh, going with the uh, Apple Silicon, Apple M1 support. Um, so uh, one of the biggest parts of this is that we, uh, with this release, we have updated our uh, HD drivers as a universal binary now, that now it is also not only compatible with Intel-based machines, but also uh, the HD drivers are uh, compatible with the Silicon-based Mac computers. And this driver supports our HDX cards, HD native, and HD native Thunderbolt uh, interfaces. So this allows for our high-end uh, customers to be able to use uh, our pro peripherals and uh, interface options with these newer computers. Uh, one thing to note, um, there is uh, definitely uh, some caveats with this. Uh, a lot of this has been things that we've talked about since pretty much the beginning of us doing DSP based systems, but uh, with these particular drivers, especially on the M1 computers, uh, you really do need to observe uh, your best practices when, when we're talking about energy management. management. So uh, no hot uh, disconnecting of a chassis or HD native Thunderbolt uh, interface while the computer's up and running. Uh, make sure that your sleep is turned off. Those things uh, will definitely cause uh, kernel, kernel panics and other issues that might uh, either damage the data of a Pro Tools session or maybe even damage your computer. So these are things that we've always talked about, and but uh, really want to make sure that people understand this. So uh, all of that information is up to date in our requirements and compatibility K bases. So uh, you can go to avid.com and uh, check those out at any time. All right. Um, one other thing to, to note is that right after this release came out, um, Apple obviously introduced their new um, M1 Pro and M1 uh, Max uh, MacBook Pros. Uh, these are not yet compatible with Pro Tools. Uh, we have not had a chance to do any testing with them, so we don't know uh, what those things, uh, what what things might and might not work yet with that particular chipset, uh, and also these machines did ship with Monterey, and Pro Tools is not Monterey compatible uh, at this point. So um, just be aware. Um, there's a lot of things, not only Pro Tools, but there's a lot of software out there that is not Monterey compatible, especially in the audio uh, space. So. Uh, just know that uh, we are working on that support and it will be available as soon as we can uh, get that taken care of. So just make sure that uh, if you do buy new machines, you know, use at your own risk. So there's going to be a lot of things that probably don't work. All right. So some other video in engine improvements that we've had uh, in uh, this 2021.10 release. Uh, uh, we have a, a new drop frame indicator, which is really cool. So basically, as you're playing your video, Pro Tools will recognize when there are drop frames, and you'll see a little red uh, indicator on the screen on the on the video track, telling you, you know, if there are drop frame frames. And if you hover over it with your mouse, you'll get a little playback report of, uh, you know, how many drop frames there were. You know, kind of just 
what's going on with this and, and, and maybe give you some indication of, of is your computer able to handle this type of uh, video codec or not and uh, kind of give you some indicators of, of what you might need to do uh, in how you want to go about trying to solve that issue. Um, also with this release, we now do have video engine support for M1 Max. Once again, the, the original M1 Max, not the new M1 Pro and M1 Max, but uh, uh, the original M1 uh, Max via Rosetta, just like Pro Tools, it's, it's via the Rosetta 2 uh, emulator. Um, and the big caveat here is, as of right now, we uh, do not have the ability to run video peripherals. So this is for desktop video only, but you do have at least some video. You can run that video out on a separate HDMI monitor. We just don't support the, the external video peripherals from either us, Blackmagic, or AJA. Um, once again, those type of things are being worked on, and uh, we will get to them as in, in, and get those things out as soon as we can. All right, so uh, next on our list of, of enhancements is something called flexible track routing. This is for our Pro Tools uh, Ultimate customers. So one thing that's always been um, an issue is, is when you have a certain track width, especially once you get over stereo into the surround, uh, formats is being able to figure out how to get that to other um, path widths. Uh, either had to make sub paths or, or, or you know do a bunch of uh, kind of uh, work in the I/O setup to get that to happen. And what we've now added is basically giving you the ability to take any track width and basically route that out of an output or bus or send um, to any other width. Um, so no longer do you have to actually make the, um, the, the sub pass for this. You can just route, you know, so you can take like, for instance, on the sc screen here, you see like a 5.1 track that we're routing out uh, to a, a 702, a 7.0.2 reverb send, and you'll see a little greater sign there. So you'll know that you're kind of routing something smaller up to a, a larger um, uh, send. Or in the case of the, the Stratus track down below it, you've got a 7.0.2 track that we're now routing out to uh, an output that's been assigned to a stereo output. So you can see like a little less than sign. So you know that you're going from a larger track width down uh, to something smaller. So uh, some indicators there, kind of what's going on. Uh, basically, we have the ability in the preferences to kind of set up either new session defaults or existing session defaults on how that's going to work. You do have a little bit of uh, adjustable routing coefficients to kind of work um, with how you want your setup to work. Uh, obviously, we've got some things in place that are pretty much uh, kind of what the professional um, standard is. But if you have other uh, options that you need to, to work within, there's definitely some ways to be able to go about um, making those changes. Um, we also have uh, um, the ability, once again, uh, for in the internal routing for sensor outputs, uh, bus maps uh, to output in the IO setup, as well as AFL, PFL, and audition paths. Where flexible track routing does not apply is to objects if you're working at Atmos, inputs or hardware inserts. All right, so um, next kind of area that we looked into making some enhancements to is the uh, kind of the UI flexibility of uh, within our color palette and how we offer that custom user uh, interface customization. Uh, the big thing here um, is we added something called high contrast U, uh, UI, and this really is for improving accessibility for our sight impaired users. It really adds a lot of um, little extra details and enhancing the UI. So uh, 
for those that are uh, sight impaired uh, and need to have other things to be able to, to navigate around, it, it helps give them some points on the screen uh, to be able to, to do that. Uh, if that's not something uh, that you need to use, then very easy to turn that off there right in the um, the the UI customization uh, high contrast UI little tick box that you can turn that on and off. Another thing that was added uh, was the ability to actually change the background and text colors. So um, I'm going to quickly show you kind of uh, a quick look at that so you can see here um we you know instead of the with the dark um theme ui uh instead of it being a gray background we are using blue background and the text instead of being light gray white is now kind of aqua um to kind of further show that a little bit i'm gonna switch over here to pro tools uh real quick and uh let's bring up the color palette so uh, right now we're kind of looking here, kind of a normal dark mode look. Um, I've got some uh, presets saved, so we can go here to the second one, kind of lightens things up. I can go to preset number three, and you can see we go to that kind of that blue background with the aqua look. And we can even change things for the classic UI theme. So. Here's a light theme with uh, an aqua background and yellow text. So uh, obviously a lot of this stuff can be saved, easily switched around in, in presets, either the five uh, preset uh, slot buttons here, or you can actually save them by name. I'm gonna switch over here real quick to the uh, mixer page. And when I turn on the high contrast UI, you're gonna see um, things get borders. So if you look here, uh, as I turn this on and off, right, actually here in the UI color palette window, you'll see some white lines show up. So these things are really kind of highlighting for those uh, sight impaired uh, customers of ours. Uh, if we switch over real quick to the um, edit window and I turn this on and off, if you look up at the toolbar, you'll see that the dividers that are very kind of in the background um, and, and kind of gray and don't really show themselves that much. If you turn on the high contrast UI, you'll see that they turn white and they really kind of help divide the screen up so people can really understand uh, where they are when they're navigating around this window. If we switch back over to the mix window and I, let's say, bypass a plugin, you'll notice that there's a little white dash that is there. Once again, it's just something that's very bright and can and help kind of enhance what is going on in that particular view. Or if we actually make something inactive, you'll see a white X show off up to the side. Once again, uh, this isn't something for everybody. So if those things, if you're not really into seeing these, you know, these all these white lines and everything kind of defining outlines of things, very easy just to turn that off in the high contrast UI section of the general section of the color palette. So very easy to kind of get around that. All right, so um, let's go back to our uh, slides here. Uh, something really quick and easy. We basically added uh, a quick access under uh, being able to get to dedicated workspace browser view modes. So before we had default and sound base, and now we've added track presets, track presets being something that I think a lot of users are finally starting to find some really good uses for and want easy, quick ways to get in there to use them. So uh, this basically just giving users a, an easy way from a menu to quickly bring up the track presets view right within the workspace. And then kind of the, uh, for one of our hardware pieces that we brought out pretty much right about a year ago, uh, we uh, have got carbon preamp control right from within uh, Pro Tools. So if, if anybody's familiar with uh, the actual um, ability to use our old Avid Pre protocol, that's kind of how we've gotten to this. The good thing about this is uh, it's basically no setup required. Once Pro Tools knows that a carbon is hooked up, it basically will know what input channels those are on, and it's turned on that 
uh, flex or that functionality right there in the in the uh, Pro Tools software. You just need to show the mic preview at that point. Uh, basically, you have access from both the mix and edit windows to be able to to get to this information, or you can actually tear it off as a, a floating window like you see on the right hand of the screen over there. Uh, another really cool thing is that all of this control is actually accessible via Yukon. So if you have um, a uh, Avid Control app uh, on the, the channel tab, you can get to it or from any of our surfaces. So what I'm going to do here real quick is I'm going to switch views and we're going to go and look at a view now to where you should see an iPad uh, or the Avid Control app. Um, uh, S1 uh, little view of the, the strip as well as um, the carbon. So I'm going to switch back over to Pro Tools real quick. And uh, I'm going to select a channel here, this percussion track. I can click on this. You can see a, a quick uh, tear off window. I'm going to zoom in on that uh, so you can see that a little bit better. And uh, once again, I can get to this either right here uh, on the screen with the mouse, or I can easily uh, come over here and go into input on the Avid Control app, change the gain right there from the window, or I can actually do that the same thing over here on the S1. So I can go to input, put it into channel mode, and now I have... Um, there we go. I've got gain control over the attention track. I've got the ability to switch on and off phantom power, all those things directly from the surface, from Avid Control, or right there in uh, side of Pro Tools. Um, let's zoom back out here real quick. Uh, go back over to our full screen and back to the slide. Uh, what's really cool about this is you can either... Um, You can either um, basically go in and use um, these settings saved with the session. So anytime you bring back up uh, either a template or an existing session and you want those mic pre uh, or line instrument values to come back, that can actually get brought back in. Or you can uh, have it, uh, there's a checkbox in the uh, uh, hardware setup that you can tell it to retain the mic pre settings on the actual uh, unit, so it will ignore what's kind of going back is in in from the uh, uh, the session. So you can always just have what was the last saved uh, thing on the system right there and working. Uh, one extra, one more thing about carbon that we added with this is you now have the ability to switch uh, one or both of your optical ports from ADAT to optical SPDIF. So if you want to uh, use a vast array of stereo SPDIF uh, uh, hardware out there, very easy to switch into this mode and uh, use those uh, either one of those ADAT ports uh, for stereo SPDIF and uh, basically giving you uh, that information there right in the, uh, um, in the hardware setup for that. All right, so that's that's kind of uh, most of the uh, Pro Tools enhancements. The next big enhancement that we want to talk about is uh, complete control integration. And with that, I'm going to actually turn it over to Simon Sherborne. Thanks, Gil. And hello, I'm going to jump on my camera for this bit so I can show you some stuff on, on the hardware. Um, so yeah, um, complete control. Um, Many of you may have used uh, the Native Instruments Complete Control uh, keyboards already, um, and we could use them in Pro Tools before with the plugin. Um, but these keyboards have always had uh, an extra level of advanced um, integration that was available in your DAW, uh, which we've not had access to until now. Um, so I'm actually going to uh, show you how this works. Um, the the keyboards that it works with is all the current range of NI complete control keyboards. Um, so it starts with the, uh, the Mini M32, uh, and they also have the A series, and then the Mark II S series, um, which is what I've got um, here. I'm gonna show you one which has the screens. Um, and so I'm gonna show you, it gives us some extra control over Pro Tools as well as the plugins. Um, 
for um, kind of typical kind of composition type workflow. So you can stay focused on your keyboard, move around tracks, move around your timeline uh, without reaching for the mouse. Um, so the easiest way for me to do this is to show you. So I'm going to grab the screen share. OK, so if all this is working well, you should be seeing my Pro Tools screen um, with also the camera feed from my GoPro that's just here over my keyboard um, and one of the Complete Control plugins open, um, which is hopefully you can hear that. Um, as you can see, I've gone for a kind of green look with my uh, UI optimization. Um, so yeah, as I said before, this this plugin, the Complete Control plugin, um, it's an AAX plugin that hosts virtual instruments and effects. Um, obviously, it hosts all of the Complete um, Native Instruments Complete bundle, but also quite a lot of other um, suites of plugins will support this protocol, like the Arturias and Waves and Plugin Alliance. So I'll show you some of that. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to show you um, uh, just what you can do in Pro Tools directly. And you'll see if I go into the little peripherals setup page in Pro Tools now and look at my MIDI controllers, complete control is now on that list. And I can choose where it's uh, communicating. Um, now I know looking um, at YouTube, a few people had trouble getting this set up. Uh, the key thing is to make sure that this complete control DAW port, that's a USB port, um, is showing up on your computer um, and that it's selected in Pro Tools and then make sure that complete control is up to date, both the plugin and the hardware, and then it has to be this version of Pro Tools as well. And it should just connect uh, pretty much automatically to text these. And once I've done that, then some of these buttons now get directed into Pro Tools. Um, if you ever used Machina, you'll be used to using some of these controls directly in Machina, and we can still do that. And it's very quick to flip between Pro Tools control and Machina control. But right now I'm on Pro Tools. Um, so over here, I've got some transport. So I can obviously play, stop. I can also go into record. I can switch the click on and off. I can switch loop on and off. And I've got some other functionality like undo uh, on here as well. Um, I can also control the transport position. Um, so if you look on my time ruler, you can see that as I turn this encoder here, my playback position is um, moving around. Let's actually just zoom in on this view a little bit while we're not looking at the plugin. So you can see all of the complete um, plug, um, keyboards have this encoder. It's a four way encoder. It works as like a joystick and a encoder. So I can change my playback position. I can update my play on the fly just by hitting play again. So I can do that. I'm in dynamic transport. I can also, if I hold down the loop button, I can move the whole in and out point selection. So I can work, as you can see the, on my timeline here, I've kind of worked in four bar chunks and added things as I go. And I just moved along using the encoder so I didn't have to come back to the screen. Uh, which was great. So that's the transport. Also um, up here on this section here, I've got control of various different um, modes. So at the moment I'm controlling plugin mode. Um, so that's actually giving me a view into the complete control plugin and giving me pre-mapped macro controls on these encoders here. But if I switch into mixer mode here, then I now have control of the Pro Tools mix window. If you probably can't see, but my S1 is moving along with us in the background as well. Um, so I've got mixer control. I can also um, control mute and solo. And then channel and these top buttons. And I can also use these as selects. So for example, you can see that this particular channel is selected. Now if I select another channel, that's going to select in Pro Tools. And if I look back at my plugin view, what you'll see is that the keyboard has automatically looked at that track and has started focusing on that particular track. Um, 
So just have a quick look what I've got running in Pro Tools. I've got a few tracks here with the Complete Control plugin on. Um, there's an empty one there, which we can play with in a minute. Now, one of the really possibly the most cool feature of the integration is that if I select these tracks, either from the mixer like that or from the encoder, so I can actually just move left and right through the tracks, then it will select the track. It will also record arm it so that the keyboard is focused MIDI on that. But it will also notice that the complete control plugin is on that track and give me the controls on that track. And that's absolutely like game changing really when, when you're working with this. Okay, so that's the integration. Let's have a little look at, um, oh yeah, actually one thing I should show you is if I um, nudge across to um, a track that doesn't have complete control on, for example, this track's got a vacuum virtual instrument just directly on the track, not via the complete control plugin, then you'll see that my keyboard is actually switched to a generic MIDI control mode. So I can still control any plugin and I can make templates from the encoders here. And then yeah, if I move back to another track, it will intelligently update into complete control mode. So you get this back and forward linking. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of some of the scope you, stuff you can do with this thing, if I, um, let's look at this last track here. This is an empty um, complete control instance um, I actually always keep a track preset that looks like this just an empty track with complete control um, and I can go in and let's move this again so we can really see what's happening what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the browser uh, and select that one's track go back into the browser and now I get access to all of the plugins and effects that are within that complete library. Um, so I can scroll through. I can actually search by sound type or by actual plugin. Um, let's try there's an Arturia CZ101, which was my first ever synth. And let's say, just show me bass sounds. And I can load that in and you'll see that that will um, load up that plugin into that instance of complete control and then play it and I'll automatically get pre-mapped parameter control across multiple pages depending on how that plugin manufacturer set that up. Um, I can also do things like add an arpeggiator um, into the track just by clicking the arp button. Just give it some more like that. Um, and then just jumping back into the browser, uh, into the plugin view, you'll see I can actually create a chain. So if I move across to the next slot and go back into the browser, and now I'm looking at effects. Um, so again, it's going to look at stuff that's within that library and um, didn't necessarily have to be an AAX at this point. Um, let's go for oh, something nasty. So Jump through presets. Yeah, and then again I can add a reverb. Let's go for the end line. Brown. There you go. So that's essentially um, pretty much what I want to show you. Um, I just wanted to say before I hand over to Jeff, um, Gil mentioned about 
some of the improvements in the protocols user interface for visually impaired uh, users. Um, this is also really useful in that capacity. So, you know, if you are visually impaired or if you kind of if you're interested in um, the accessibility features, you'll know that Pro Tools already has a strong um, feature set of voiceover where it will essentially read out everything that you're doing. Um, the NI uh, complete uh, control keyboards and the, and the plugin do exactly the same. So we can actually have it so that every time I press a button on here, it's, it's speaking out what I'm doing. Um, so the two are working together to make a really fantastic uh, composition workflow for visually impaired users. Okay, uh, I think that's everything that I wanted to show you. So it's probably a good time to hand over to Jeff. Sounds good. Thank you, Simon. Uh, I'm going to steal the share as well. And we're going to take a look at some Yukon. Um, so um, awesome. So um, we want to take a quick look at uh, the release of Yukon 2021.10. Uh, uh as well and um some of the improvements that are there now overwhelmingly the majority of this is for s4 and s6 so i'm just gonna, gonna uh, quickly kind of go through it and then i want to show you in 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 the flesh uh, an actual kind of what those improvements have um how they manifest on the console um so there's really kind of two categories there is a significant uh really actually a pretty dramatic improvement in performance on the consoles on s4 and s6 and that is really all things opening a project closing a project um spilling food groups of things like vcas and and folders basics and routings um any types of drawing of data on the desk in terms of um uh in terms of function views right knobs populating knobs and faders and displays and things like that and then also attentioning and being able to quickly write automation um from uh, attentioning so um very, very significant. Um, a lot of sessions will open at least twice as fast. Uh, and this is really a big deal in large post-production or large music sessions, especially when we start talking about immersive audio and Atmos. In addition to that, we've added the ability to um, take advantage of swap layer. And swap layer is very exciting. Uh, it applies to both S4 and S6 space systems. I'm gonna show you here in just a second, kind of what you can do with that. Um, and then there are some additional, um, uh, some small Yukon improvements in terms of preferences and, and soft keys and things like that. So let's talk about swap layer a little bit. Swap layer basically takes the concept of a track layout. And just to kind of refresh, a track layout is the idea that I can take Take any tracks from one or multiple workstations um, that's attached to my console, and I can populate those tracks in the order that I want on my desk. Um, and um, so what Swap Layer basically says is that you can have up to four layers deep on every individual strip. Right, so it's um, it's it's uh, there's a, a a a layer concept essentially, so that you can either flip A B C D or even on S six just flip individually. So the global swap is available for both S six and S four, and you can see that at the bottom um, of the master module. The individual swap, which I'm going to show you I'm in a demo, is only available on S six, and that's a really handy. Just quickly be able to. Um, uh, quickly be able to uh, uh, cycle one particular strip, right? And um, some really powerful workflows uh, within that. Uh, take a look at kind of a, a little bit of a, a, a maximized view here so you can see what the actual scribble, the OLED looks like. Uh, the swap uh, LED lights up if there's, if swap layer, if you've uh, programmed the swap layer, um, you can see that's a, a, a VCA master for a, for a bunch of music tracks. Um, and it shows you what layer you're on, A, B, C, D, if you've, uh, if you've allocated that um, and, and some controls um, as such. Um, you don't have to use all four layers. You can actually tell it, you know, I want to just use two layers or three layers. So it's completely up to you and every strip can be independent. Um, so that's also very, very cool. In terms of performance, again, big changes um, to the way things feel and move around and navigate and bank and populate on the desk. There's also another little feature or preference in there that is also uh, an improvement in on top of the basic optimizations. 
And that is the idea called excluded inactive tracks. And so it basically says in large projects, most people have, uh, you know, temp uh, overdubs or AAFs or temp designs or just elements that need to travel with the session file, especially in a collaborative environment. Um, so what this allows you to do is basically to say, tell S4, S6 to um, optimize um, and basically, um, uh, am I not sharing? Oh, okay. Um, was uh, okay. Uh, can you see? <laughs> can you see everything now? Yeah. I guess. Uh, Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I've explained everything, but you saw nothing. So I'm going to go back through it quickly and then we'll get onto the practical where we, uh, sorry about that, where we actually see what's going on. So, um, uh, so just to back up, and I, this doesn't really require further explanation because you'll, um, you'll see a lot of this as we describe it. So let's actually just jump over to swap layers. So you can see this. Um, basically, conceptually, multiple layers beneath one or multiple tracks up to four layers deep uh, on the console on S4 or S6. S4 supports basically um, uh, swap layer globally, so changing each layer, if you will. Um, and S6 supports individual strips, right? So individual strips can be swapped. And I'm gonna show you that here in just a second. Um, just to kind of zoom in a little bit further, uh, you have uh, some, some uh, preferences that allow you to set the number of layers, right? So um, it could be up to four, but you don't have to use four. You could use two, you could use three. Um, completely depends on your workflow. And every every strip could have, um, uh, you know, the number of, um, of layers that you wanna populate. They don't all have to be occupied, okay? So um, significant performance improvements um, and, um, there's also a feature in here that I just started to talk about, which is excluded inactive tracks. And basically it says, hey, you know what? There's probably a hundred and some elements in this session. I don't want to remove them. I don't want to delete them because this is going to go to Gil or it's going to go to Tony. It's going to go to somebody else. I don't want to remove those, but why do I need to wait for the console to actually look at those and cache those? And so this is a really cool feature that on top of the significant performance improvements with S4 and S6, this also says, you know what? Don't worry about those inactive tracks that are temps or AAF or or rough design elements um, if I need those I can then you know put those online and then it can it'll instantly cache those things so it's just another optimization um, on top of uh, of the significant performance improvements that we see in this version um, just a couple other things, and I'm not going to go into super detail here because I want to show you the practical. Actually, look, take a look at the console. Um, but there's indication on the strips to tell you that you've you've left the first layer or the A layer, and that's kind of a nice reference to say, hey, you have swap layers and you're not on the layer A anymore. You can simply quickly do an attention swap to get back to layer A, um, some things like that. Um, you also have the ability, if you want to turn it on, to see uh, the reference to up to four layers on the display module, right? So you can see in this example here, I have uh, the top layer is a background, a background's routing folder. Nested under that is one of the background VCA masters. And then there's a master, and then for example, an effects verb, effects return, right? So that just tells me that I could I could press swap twice, and I can actually get to the master VCA, for example, in that case. So um, so that's that's pretty cool. Um, that's the idea there. So what I want to do now is let's just flip over to uh, a view of the console. You should be able to see my console. And um, what I wanted to do is just kind of show you an example of quickly creating a layout. We're still doing okay on time. Uh, and just the concept of why this is really cool. Um, yeah, you could certainly build a whole bunch of layouts and have different views, but swap layer gives you immediate access to multiple layers. Uh, and I think there's some very, very powerful ideas that you can take advantage of. So let's build something. Um, and so I've got a, this is an S6, um, uh, 16 faders. We're gonna go and simply just jump right into uh, a sign mode. I'm gonna touch a sign and we're gonna throw some drum tracks on the desk really quickly. I'm gonna take advantage of um, 
of filtering, right? And filter says, just only show me auxes or VCAs, or in this case, audio tracks. And I'm just gonna say, bring my drum tracks down and just bring those down onto the desk. And right now I'm looking at sends and I'm looking at pan and I've got my drum tracks. And so I can see these are all on layer A, okay? If I press the master or the global swap, it's going to take me to B. And it actually tells you at the top of the of the touch screen that, hey, you're now on layer B. So for example, on layer B, I could say, you know what, maybe some of my drum processing chains, like a parallel compressor or a level lock or a pro sub harmonic, I could put there. And then maybe some effects returns that are specific to the drums I could put there. I get to pick and choose what I want. So what I would do is I would actually go into aux, um, for example, and say, uh, I would like to have some of that processing that would be really useful to drop that down here uh, so i've got access to my parallel i've got access to my level lock and then a pro sub harmonic i also can tell it what view i want it to remember so in this case i want to see the signal chain view um and then let's actually bring down some um some of the particular um uh, effects returns right the the reverbs that are being used for the drums i'll bring those down as well and then maybe I also want to have access to, uh, let's actually go back to the folders for a second to show you how this works. Maybe I want to have quick access to just the drums, right? So what I've done is I brought the drum routing folder down and I want to be able to, since it is a routing folder, I can process from it, right? I can actually EQ or compress or do saturation on that level, right? On the entire cluster of drum elements. And so that's kind of the idea. So let's just stop with two layers for now. I can keep kind of iterating. And all I've got to do is say store and drop it in a location. And um, and, and and basically though, I can I can instantly get back to that. So let's let's go let's go from kind of where we were and show you some some of the workflow implications of being able to take advantage of swap layer. So I'm going to go and just recall a little bit further built out version of what we were just working on. And if you remember at the top layer, we had drums, right? We had our drums with, with the sends that I can send to specific reverbs and the parallel and the level lock and the pro sub. That's all pretty cool. If I go to layer B, I can see those, those processing, those returns of the parallel and the subs. I can see the returns of the verbs. I have my drums routing folder accessible as well as some specific reverbs and delay VCAs. And those can be flipped if I want into a VCA view. We'll go to layer C real quick. I've got um, some uh, specific uh, VCAs and I've got specific drum processing. So let me show you some cool stuff here. Let's go back to layer A. Let's say I wanna look at the drums, but I also wanna look at the specific parallels that are being used on the drums. I can swap to get to drum processing and I can peel that off. And I've peeled that off so that now if I send into a parallel or send into a level lock, those are all coming up right here. Basically, here's the return for um, for my spank um, and the level lock. So let's just bring that up real quick. I'm gonna take advantage of, I'm gonna push in and um, I'm gonna take advantage of basically we're doing custom plugin controls on the encoders and also pl custom plugin controls on the faders. And that's what's going on here. I can blend the mix in, I can do all of that. And then I can pop back out and it's gonna show me back my returns view. Same, same thing if I wanna control the low end to a subharmonic generator, um, I'm gonna actually quickly attention that. I'm gonna push into the pro subharmonic, it brings that up. And then I can blend in specific low frequency that I'm that I'm kicking and the drive characteristics and the mix and all of that. So so that is a, a really powerful kind of idea to be able to, to to move around. And I've just kind of thrown I've spilled off into a second um, bucket or spill zone, if you will, from the drum processing. We could do the same thing. I could actually leave this in place if I want, and I can globally go to the next layer. And now check it out. I've got all the drums, as I said, which are flowing through this drum routing folder, which I could EQ, right? And so now I'm EQing the entire drum uh, drum set, uh, or all the drum elements through that particular routing folder. Let's take it one more one step further. Let's say I want to peel off the the reverbs that are being used uh, just for uh, for the drums. So what I could do is we could actually go in here and take a look at individual layers. So let's actually flip back to Let's go to the third layer here for a second. And let's say I want to look at, oh, let's actually go and bring the uh, the drum uh, effects over. So let's go, let's go back, actually go back to B, okay? 
So when you cycle with the with the uh, with the global swap, it's going to cycle the entire uh, the entire layer, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna peel off the the verbs, okay? So I've got now all the effects returns kind of broken off, and um, we'll cycle back through here. Look at the drums. Um, now here's another cool thing. I have my entire um, folder, basic folder for the entire, all the food groups. And what, why is that cool? Well, basically I can spill that off and um, that then gives me access to, maybe I wanna see the drums and the bass in context. I can bring the bass, all the bass tracks up quickly because my food groups have been, have been brought over, right? So once again, I've spilled the whole subfolder of all of the elements of drums, bass, guitars, uh, um, acoustic guitars at once and I just want to see all the bass elements and the drums at the same time, right? If I want to get back to my drum processing, there's all my parallels, right? If I want to get back to, um, you know, any particular element, I can, I can bring the drums over to the right side, and then I can spill down and go to the, the parallels over here, as well as the drum room and the drum hall. So I'm really, I'm giving myself a whole bunch of different paths to be able to navigate and control. And I intentionally built this into literally eight faders. So I made it as small as possible, just to show you kind of some of the creative options of being able to quickly flip through and say, you know what, let's let's get back to our, uh, let's get back to our drum processing. Boom, it's right there. Let's flip back and look at, um, you know, uh, just some of our kicks. Let's go back and look at, um, you know, whatever particular elements we want to get to, right? Hey, Jeff, can you have so, the, there you go. thanks. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, sorry. So, um, so, so that's a little bit uh, about swap layer. Um, it is taking advantage of, it's taking advantage of track layouts. It can be instantly recalled on S4. I can globally swap layer A, B, C, and D if I have it on S6, I can individually swap so that I could peel off drums or I could peel off drum parallels or I could peel off uh, any food group, for example, we talked about bass, um, within my session instantly. And so this is kind of the idea with this, um, uh, with regard to swap layer. And as you, you probably can see, but as I flip through, every layer can be different in terms of not only the, uh, the track, but also the function, right? Am I controlling, am I controlling dynamics? Um, am I controlling sends? Am I controlling EQ? Right? And you can see those change, or am I looking at VCA view? Um, and also what I'm seeing on the display modules as well. And again, this could be one, uh, this could be tracks from one workstation or multiples. You could have tracks from Logic and Pro Tools simultaneously. You could have tracks from multiple Pro Tools systems. You can even have controls for, you know, preamp control or monitor control in matrix on different layers, um, uh, as well as your, your audio tracks. For example, a split console where you're actually controlling the preamp into the track and then the actual print track and kind of flipping back and forth. And you can do all of that. So a lot of really powerful uh, capabilities. Um, so, um, yeah, a very excellent. And I, um, so let's, uh, maybe take it back and see if we have any questions and we'll open it up. So right now we've got two questions, Jeff, um, that are based around uh, the Yukon release. So the first one is, does all of the Yukon S6 layout swap layer travel with the Pro Tools session or stay with S6 title or both? Right. Um, so, so yes, uh, the, uh, the, um, just like the, uh, just like custom maps, just like track layouts, just like meter layouts, the swap layer information does travel with the, um, with the Pro Tools session, assuming you associate your Pro Tools as being the, um, uh, the app that you want, excuse me, things to travel with. Absolutely. And we're looking at, it's probably kind of hard to see, but we're looking at all the attributes that can be saved with the session. And that's custom maps, that's track layouts. Um, but yes, the the spill, the swap layer is really an, another component of the track layout, right? So it's really just taking what was already that information that was already in the track layout and building it up to four layers deep. So absolutely, it does it does travel with the Pro Tools session. All right, we have a question. I'll go ahead and take this one um, uh, about 
uh, layouts on S1 and U control. So uh, Stefan asks, is it possible to assign tracks to a layout by selecting the channels on the S1, maybe in combination with a modifier key? And that's a, a great feature request, but as of this time, uh, the only way to assign channels to a layout within a U control environment is either manually through the U control um, uh, software on the host computer on the layout tab. You can go in and whatever session you have up, you can basically with a mouse click and get a list of what to select there. And with our earlier release this year, uh, UConn release, you can now do it from the track page uh, from the Avid Control app. But as of right now, um, you cannot do that from the S1 or S3 surfaces, something that um, may be possible in the future. Definitely would have to log that as a feature request and kind of see how that uh, kind of floated up. But uh, as of right now, either from the app or from the Avid Control app on a tablet. So we've got uh, seven minutes or so left. Uh, Right now, we don't have any open questions. If there are any other questions about um, kind of what we've seen today here with the Pro Tool and Yukon releases uh, from 2021.10, um, here happy to answer those or any other questions that you might have that we can. Um, definitely wanted to 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 make sure uh, one of the, the the things to kind of reiterate back with the complete control. Um, uh thing is that it's it's not up to us to what what gets uh supported from hardware that's all up to ni and how they we're just uh, having pro tool hooked into their their software uh platform on that um so it really is it's all about having the newer controllers the the a series the s series mark ii and the m32 those are the ones that do work with this and uh, the the S series Mark II, they definitely have a little bit more deeper integration. Once again, from an NI standpoint, because of having more switches, the bigger displays, you have a lot more things that you can kind of do with that. Um, to get yeah, again, got, I saw a, a question came in on that, asking about Machina and whether Machina Jam or Machina would would work. And, and that's, again, a, a no. Those, it, it's just the complete control keyboards that have that functionality. So I thought it was worth mentioning for anyone who's not in the Zoom and maybe didn't see that question. Uh, as far as there's a question, any updates, are UConn updates uh, with the Artist Series surfaces? Um, uh, Basic things uh, are getting added um, with uh, our Yukon releases to our older surfaces, but some of this newer functionality, like being able to map plugins and things like that, that's really we can only support so far back, and that really is for our, our newer surfaces. Uh, another question came in, any possibility to mix S1 with other S products? And uh, answer to that is, uh, it's not, I mean, it, it doesn't, from our standpoint and how we support the surfaces, that's, that it really isn't something we can do. I mean, you choose to either go with the S1 surfaces, have some modularity to add one to four of those. You can actually add, obviously, a dock and multiple tablets to that system. Um, but the S3 um, is really its own thing. And um, so it kind of, it's off on its own as well as S4 and S6, that's a totally different platform uh, within the Yukon family. And uh, no, we're, we won't be able to have supported S1s along with uh, the bigger S4, S6. Uh, anybody else see any questions that are coming up that they want to take? Uh, just uh, uh, the the, the question was with regard to being able to uh, 
sort through and find something within the complex matrix of soft keys for you control, but uh, that would also apply to, to um, workstation as well. Um, I know Eddie has has um, indicated that he does want to have a better interface to be able to quickly find uh, the soft key that you can uh, that you want to use right to be able to program it to a key. So that's good feedback and it's something that we're aware of and we want to improve that. Uh, there's a question um, that uh, okay. Gil from uh, Ivan um, or Ivan about asking about if folder open and close on the consoles is related to hard disk speed. Um, it's not um, what, but it's worth mentioning. Yeah, that, that um, in this current release, the, the any of those kind of operations where the desk updates, where you kind of open a group or a folder or spill something to the desk, has been massively speeded up with some optimization. So you, you'd see a difference with that. And yeah, especially when, especially when you when you have large uh, collections of tracks in folders and then nested hierarchical either VCAs or folders, you'll see a huge improvement with regard to 2110 Yukon, which requires 2110 Pro Tools to get that optimization. I was going to mention that it's it, it's both sides, both pieces of software have to be updated to that latest version to take advantage yeah. of the speed increases. So you'll you'll see a little bit of optimization with 2110 with older versions of Pro Tools, but you'll see a massive like more than twice as fast uh, using that combination of, of, of versions. Uh, questions come in improvements in the IO setup and larger Dolby Atmos setup. Um, that really hasn't changed much in the uh last several versions so uh, it's definitely things that you know are on our optimization schedule as we keep trying to improve pro tools but we don't have any kind of news at this time when that would actually be released all right well uh, we're kind of here at the top of the hour so i myself and also Jeff and Simon, we want to thank you uh, for being here for this. And we also want to thank all of our our team around the world that are helping out on the other social platforms out there that we're streaming to. Uh, we thank you for being here. Um, I believe this is probably our last Pro Tools Tech Talk webinar uh, for the year, but uh, definitely at the first of the year, look for uh new uh indications of, of some of the things that we'll be talking about in the future so in behalf of all of us from avid thanks for being here and we'll see you again real soon